Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be reading from this book called The Book of Symbols, Reflections on Archetypal Images. It's a pretty big book. But I'm not really sure that I'm going to um, make a series with this because I'm already working on two book series. But if you want me to make more videos with this, then it would help if you gave this video a like and maybe subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any uh, videos from me. And I'll look into um, reading more from this book if you enjoy it. So, um, there's different types of symbols. Um, different sections. So instead of reading it page by page, I'm going to go through this book in a random order, like everything in a random order. Um, there are lots of pictures in here, so I'm going to read the text first and then show you the corresponding picture. Okay. So let's see what I can find. Okay. We're going to start with a symbol in movement and expression, the airplane. Filling the sky and forming a quaternity Middendorf's airplane reflects his haunting memory of the Berlin airlift, which brought food and medical supplies to German cities leveled by Allied bombers. The neo-expressionist image painted long after the destruction of the artist's homeland transposes the horrors of aerial bombardment into an organic fantasy of the creative self that can survive despite adversity, integrate devastation, and overcome trauma, by giving it aesthetic significance. The simple biplane of World War I evolved into the massive monoplane that ended the Second World War by dropping an atom bomb. Only a generation earlier, aviators first mastered taking off from the ground in their heartless, uh, harmless biplanes, rising into the seemingly weightless air. With its awkward double tier of wings, the biplane was soon relegated to air shows and crop dustings, while the monoplane was equipped with powerful jet turbines. During the war, airplanes also acquired a mystique. Photographs of their nicknamed noses were pinned up by fiancés of pilots about to take off on no-return missions or they were enshrined next to a boy's kite as a romance that later ripened into his profession as a commercial pilot. Gazing back at these photographs, we can still hear the drone of Amelia Earhart's aircraft disappearing into the void that lured, air, um, lured early aviators away from terra firma. What began as a retooling of Da Vinci's foot-powered aircraft in 1903, when Orville Wright's biplane sustained flight for 12 seconds, soon evolved into sky-darkening bombers and the jumbo jets that routinely fly several billion passengers each year. Using merely the resistance of air molecules to gain lift under their wings, Airplanes turned human attention to the skies and beyond the clouds to outer, um, to outer space, excuse me, as a medium for human travel. Psyche soon reflected these innovations in dreams that replaced Pegasus with Piper Cubs and Zeus's Thunderbolts with the Blue Angels. Our nightmares replaced medieval apocalypses with the terrors of aerial bombardment, accompanied by piercing air raid sirens and earth-shattering bombs, or the modern anxiety of a jet crashing to earth, or now into office towers. Despite their statistical safety, 
Anxious passengers staring down at farm fields miles below experience turbulence or a thrusting engine as a warning that their scent has violated their natural place on Earth. Ancient Greek stage managers invented deus ex machina cranes to lift actors playing deities into the air, but kept humans below on Earth. Anything else would signify hubris, and like Phaeton in his out-of-control sun chariot, or Icarus with his melting wings, bring them plunging to Earth. If we can calm these fears, the vision from an airplane window provides us with an objective overview that was once the sole prerogative of the gods. An ironic consequence of this sublimated perspective is that we are so far above the concrete realities below that, unlike the gods, we are impotent to act upon them. As aviation became commonplace, filling our skies with its long jet trails, the anxiety of missing flights, being stalled before takeoff, or even skyjacked, replaced metaphors that departed trains, lame horses, and pirates at sea had expressed in earlier eras. Now, once their earphones are inserted and their eyes closed, even seasoned jet travelers may return to the same timeless dreams of flight that lured pioneering aviators into the, um, into the cockpit. Peter Pan's summons to fly off to a wonderland and never grow up speaks to our longing to escape the tedium and tension of terrestrial life, even if we admire the well-grounded person who scoffs at our air-headed flights of imagination. Yet valid genius and inspired innovations do originate in the upward sublimation of our lower preoccupations, ultimately prompted by our innate urge to reclaim the inner heights from which we first came, trailing clouds of, go of glory. Then, our longing to fly finds its true pioneers in the shaman's magical flight, in the yogi's levitation, and the swift angels of Islam and Christianity. Recognizing in the airplane waiting to taxi down the runway, no less a marvel than these legendary prototypes for having made flight a reality. So I'll show you the picture. Pretty eerie, isn't it? <laughs> Doesn't really help my, my fear of flying. Okay, give me just a moment. Now, um, we're going to move on to another symbol. This is in Tools and Other Objects. I'm going to read about the knife and dagger. That the bronze knife from ancient China is fashioned as a human hand gripping the hilt above the sharp blade serves to enhance the knife's character as emblem not only of human survival, but also the sharp edge of human consciousness that carved out the structures of its civilizations. Stone Age hunters used the earliest versions of the knife to kill and skin animals of prey and render the skins into clothing and shelter. Their knives slashed through twisting roots and thick, impenetrable vines to open pathways and eventually whittled at raw materials until they revealed their emergent forms. An essential implement in the fields of war, exploration, and adventure, in the workshop, kitchen, art studio, and operating room, the knife engages the killing instinct, but also the energies of healing, creativity, and cooking magic with intimacy and nuance. Knife is no blunt instrument, but embodies the efficacy and violence of a cutting edge. Mounted on a staff, the knife becomes a spear, a spear. Extended in length, a sword whose smaller version is the dagger, especially designed for stabbing. Both knives and daggers are distinguished as weapons of stealth and proximity, 
unable to be concealed on one's person. Used at close range where victim and attacker are no more than an arm's length apart. The knife evokes images of deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat as well as bloody murders and mutilations, gang wars, and decapitations. Sudden, cutting violence and betrayal from which derive the metaphorical stabbing in the back or shooting daggers. Its capacity for swift, precision cutting has given the knife a conspicuous place in the rituals and iconography of cultures as varied as the Hebrew, Celtic, Aztec, and Hindu, whereas the implement for slaying sacrificial victims over sacred vessels, it released the libido of fertilization and renewal signified by the offertory blood. Traditional instrument of Abraham's ritual circumcision, the knife becomes the instrument of a symbolic sacrifice that since ancient times implies for the Jewish male the voluntary cutting away of an aspect of himself to join a larger sacred covenant. Just a moment, I need some tea. In Tibetan Buddhism, the furba or magical ritual dagger embodies the compassionate action of the wrathful deity Vajra Kalaya. The Furba's triple blade signifies the spiritual tools that sever the roots of ignorance, desire, and hatred, which poison human existence. Knife continues both to serve and symbolically depict the human intellect that cuts through the superfluous and entangling, analytically separates and differentiates, but is also capable of overbearing and soulless dissection. The knife is implicated in the perverse intimacy of compulsive self-mutilation and the seeking of aliveness through pain. Psychologically, it gets embodied in the surprise attacks of unconscious dynamisms of effect and aggression, personified in the breaking and entering assailants that worry our dreams, or mythic figures like the Egyptian Set, whose attribute is the flint knife. Knife can represent an instrument of meaningless destruction, but also a superb tool of deconstruction and adaptation. In T.S. Eliot's words, the mythic knife as the surgeon's scalpel Questions the distempered part, a deft wounding that precedes synthesis. Okay, so let me show you the picture again. Whoops, <laughs> sorry. Next, I'm going to read about silence as a symbol. There are silences and silences. The woman in Odilon Redden's painting invokes silence, and in her meditative appearance, she seems to seek more than a personal silence in which something is better left unsaid more even than the odd silence in which we might sit at the lip of the Grand Canyon on a quiet evening. She calls us instead to that deepest silence in which the voice of the Holy Other may be heard. At the symbolic level, silence is a part of every sacred tradition, for each knows that profound mysteries may address us only in silence, as the monastic rules of silence in the West encourage. In a Quaker meeting, a sustained silence may work mysteriously to bring members together. A word spoken as a call or leading from within the silence may evoke a higher truth. The Holy Spirit is the companion of silence. A philosopher once asked the Buddha, Without words, without the wordless, will you tell me the truth? The Buddha kept silent. 
since real silence is beyond both words and wordlessness. By this answer, the philosopher was freed from delusion. Pretty nice, right? Sometimes we seem to underestimate just how loud silence can be. Okay. Um, next, we'll go into mythical beings and I'll read about the vampire. So, <clears throat> a suave man encompasses a beautiful swooning woman in his bat-like his bat-like cape, and draws her close as if for a kiss. But wait, his look is feral and predatory; his eyes those of a deadly lover. To our gasps of horror and fascination, a vampire is about to sink his fangs into the neck of his hapless victim and drink her blood. The photograph of a movie still from 1931 is pure Hollywood, the origin of the image older and darker. The vampire is a monster of both genders that drains the blood of a living person. The English novelist Bram Stoker popularized the vampire in his 1897 Dracula, from which the film version was made. But the centuries-old vampire lore, especially of Central Europe, is echoed in the legends of blood-sucking demons throughout the world. The vampire is a strange phenomenon of the imagination, a shapeshifter, hypnotist, and captivator, erotic and chillingly repugnant at the same time. He or she is often ravishingly irresistibly seductive. That the vampire is also represented as a form of were-animal, fanged and nocturnal, suggests that as a psychic factor, it shuns the light of consciousness, manifesting in the twilight of the subliminal as a sexual compulsion, or another form of raw, insatiable hunger that cannot be put to rest and eventually takes possession of the whole personality. Psyche portrays the vampire as one of the most compelling and libido-draining aspects of the inner other, and part of its paradoxical attraction is that it is potentially dangerous. Some have compared the vampire to the hungry ghost, the revenant of unmetabolized deprivation and trauma which obsesses us keeping us out of life. The most deadly aspect of the classic vampire is that with each attack, it replicates its condition in the victim, who becomes one of the melancholy, exhausted, or restless dead. More contemporary portrayals have idolized the vampire as a being of pale, lunar beauty, soulfulness, wisdom, and magical powers combined with exhilarating animal instinctuality. In this version, because the vampire lives forever, it can teach us the lessons of history. The human and vampire lovers of the popular Twilight series reflect the youthful romance between consciousness of process and change and the alluring fantasy of physical perfection, immutability, and immortality. But though the vampire can never again become human, a human can become a vampire, suggestive of our vulnerability to the wholly absorbing nature of desire. How would you like to be bitten by one of those? <laughs> mm. 
Next, I'm going to read about incense. For thousands of years, the aromatic smoke of incense has ascended, symbolically merging material and non-material realms of being in its diffuse, spiraling, vaporous cloud. It has signified the fragrant arrows of that conjunction in ceremonial, meditation, and rites of worship. Let my prayer be set forth in your sight as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. From Psalm 141. Two of the three precious gifts the Magi mythically presented to the infant Jesus were incense, frankincense, emblematic of his divinity, and myrrh, his future death on the cross. Frankincense and myrrh are obtained from the dried sap of two different species of a botanical family of plants common to present-day Somalia. Both resins were extraordinarily prized in ancient Mesopotamia, Africa, Egypt, and India for religious ritual and healing. At Sinai, God was said to have commanded Moses to have frankincense and myrrh blended with spices into fine oils for anointing and consecration. The ancient Egyptians used frankincense as an antidote to hemlock and as an essential ingredient in cosmetics. Daily worship of the sun god Ra included burning golden resin at dawn, myrrh at noon, and at sunset a compound of frankincense, honey, and wine, symbolic of harmony. Myrrh, which is softer than frankincense and has antiseptic and anti-inflammatory properties, was an ingredient in the Egyptian embalming and deification mysteries of the dead. Greek soldiers carried supplies of myrrh into, into, uh, into battle as a medicinal for cleaning wounds and pre preventing infection. Myrrh's association with both death and cleansing is carried in Ovid's Metamorphosis, where Myrrh, the maiden whose incestuous love for her father produced Adonis, is transformed into a tree whose weeping sap is her repentant tears. The sensual and sacred qualities of incense have made it an aspect of cultic rites throughout the world. Copal resin is burned in domestic and religious rituals of Mesoamerica. In China, the burning of Xiang was a part of ancestral cults and accompanied writing and the performance of music. On the Mexican Day of the Dead, the burning of incense guides the spirits to their former homes. Christian churches make ritual use of incense as purification. The fragrance of incense evokes the presence of the divine and the flowering gardens of paradise. Pungent fumes of ritual incense rose over the effigy of Babylonian Tammuz, uh, Ishtar's beloved, in order to awaken him from the sleep of death so that the earth could be regenerated each spring. Similarly, the phoenix fabricates her nest of frankincense and myrrh, ultimately to be reborn in its perfumed smoke. what else I can find. Let me pause again. Next, I'm going to read about ashes. This is in the same section as the previous symbol, um, rituals and sacred systems. So, the familiar litany of ashes to ashes, dust to dust, forebodes our decomposition and return to origin. Through the agency of fire, flesh, bones, and other matter, turn into the mixture of carbonates and oxides we call ash. Whether flames have licked away a log on the hearth, 
or consumed a human body on a funeral pyre. This colorless, odorless silt is all that remains. On ash, we project finality, irrevocability, what has gone cold after the heat and light of desire, hope, creativity, or generation has been extinguished. Ash is holocaust, the devastation of bombs, the end of love, a gutted structure. Sackcloth and ashes clothe the figure of remorse, sorrow, or abasement. Yet ash is also associated with the sacred and the essential. Ash is the extract from a completed life or an achieved process, the substance that can undergo no further decomposition. Full customs and religious rites express the symbolism of ash as fertilizer of physical and psychic earth, which fosters the emergence of new matter and gives rise to the phoenix of rebirth. Farmers sprinkle their fields with ashes before planting and blend them with stored grain to prevent rot. The Nahuatl people of ancient Mexico rubbed infants with ashes to give them strength. Other indigenous peoples mixed funeral ashes with a liquid and imbibed the virtues of the deceased. Ascetics throughout India smear wet ashes, food from the god of fire, over their bodies. Such baths from their own or a temple sacred fire or a cremation fire signify immortality, a sacrificing of the self and a burning of karma in the fire of austerity. Lamas in Tibet combine the ashes of a holy man or woman with clay to make figurines of the Buddha to place in shrines. Ash Wednesday initiates the penitential season of Lent that culminates in the Easter resurrection. Alchemy perceived ash like salt as an emblem of the albedo, the white foliated earth resulting from the burning off of impurities, desire freed from compulsion, bitterness become wisdom. It was the substance of the incorruptible body or diadem of the heart, the paradoxical simplicity of self-knowledge. The next symbol that I'm going to read about um, will be in the section of sickness and death, and it'll actually be suicide. Okay? So, unassailable on the battlefield of the Trojan War and the bulwark of the Greek army, the hero Ajax met his untimely end at his own hands. He and Odysseus both claimed the armor of the fallen Achilles, and the dispute was settled in favor of Odysseus. Frenzied with disappointment, Ajax plotted a night raid on his comrades, but Athena thwarted it by driving Ajax mad, so that he killed a flock of sheep instead. Shamed and remorseful, Ajax committed suicide by falling on his sword. While the voluntary taking of one's own life would seem at one level to be an agonizingly private matter, its often shattering ramifications for the survivors of the victim and the implications it has for law, philosophy, medicine, religion, ethics, and politics have since ancient times made suicide a subject of public debate and controversy. The Roman Stoics perceived suicide as an acceptable and dignified way to deal with the unbearable misfortunes of life. Christian writers since the 5th century have condemned it as an appropriation of the prerogative of God. Jewish tradition forbade taking one's own life except to avoid specific threats of idolatry, murder, and sexual immorality. In Japan, harakiri, ritual suicide, 
is practiced in response to failure, loss, and love as a means of shaming one's enemies and as a way to show loyalty to a dead superior. In Hindu India, suicide was generally frowned on but honored and at one time required in sati, the self-immolation of widows on their husband's funeral pyres, a practice outlawed only in the 19th century. Buddhism and Islam formally reject suicide, but Buddhist monks have immolated themselves as a form of political protest, and Muslims have self-destructed in suicide bombings as instruments of holy war. As the ancient story of ignominy and self-annihilation depicted on the Greek face attests, however, suicide for many conjures the sharp, punishing sword of self-judgment that mortally penetrates the place of insufferable vulnerability. Whether it is an issue of honor, loneliness, defiance, or despair, the sense of an unredeemable past or future that honors no possibility, suicide often represents a flooding in the psyche of obliterating force. Passive as well as active, suicide may harbor within its violence the desire for transformation or may signify an evasion of it. There are suicides that can be understood as an unconscious effort at compensating what is hopelessly inefficient in the personality. There are accidental deaths that ensue when, unconscious of what's at stake, one refuses Psyche's faithful demand for a figurative death as self-knowledge that dissolves the fixed attitudes of consciousness. Suicide can also be experienced as an act of eros. In the grip of a suicidal impulse, the idea of killing oneself can take on the fascination and power of a sacred image and become a symbol for the self. The mythic deathly lover can seduce a woman into an act of suicide as consummation. Likewise, the anima soul can lead a man into insurmountably dangerous acts of passionate boldness and posthumous glory. Literature has often depicted the ghost of a suicide victim as desultory or vengeful. In Dante's Divine Comedy, suicides are relegated to the inferno. Such images are derived perhaps not only from religious taboo, but also from the haunting feelings many are left with in the wake of a loved one's suicide. Or they may reflect an innate tension within the psyche itself between the striving for survival and consciousness and the energies that pull toward an oblivious letting go. So this is pretty taboo, but it's kind of interesting that they included this in here. See if I can find something a little more cheerful, I guess. Let's see. Oh, hmm. I found one in Soul and Psyche. This is about um, chakras. Okay. Um. Although we do not fully understand the mysterious inner phenomena of the chakras, they are imagined to be the centers for the essential life force surrounding, permeating, and emanating from within particular parts of the human body. In India, this force is called prana. In China, qi. Um, hang on. Pythagoreans called it luminous body light, and in the Middle Ages, Paracelsus spoke of iliaster, the vital force. Chakras metabolize different kinds of energy, transmitting them to appropriate places within the auric field. Each chakra acts like a vortex of energy rolling at different rates of vibration, which range from gross, very slow, 
to settle extremely fast, depending on the specific chakra and the individual person. Optimally, each chakra is open and moving in a clockwise direction. If chakras are congested, closed, or reversed, the energy is unable to flow freely, potentially impacting well-being. There are seven major chakras, starting with the first or base chakra, located at the perineum, which informs and supports all other chakras um, up to the top of the head, called the crown chakra. In addition, there are approximately 23 minor chakras located throughout the body, such as on the palm of each hand, the bottom of each foot, behind the knees, and etc. Hundreds of minuscule chakras spread throughout the body are called acupuncture points. All of them contribute to how we act intrapsychically and interpersonally with the world around us. We continuously influence the chakras and are influenced by them throughout our lives through psychological efforts. Physical activity, diet, meditation, and quality of life. Each major chakra can be actively engaged for the purpose of awakening greater consciousness. Colors, sounds, numbers, elements, deities, and animal entities associate each chakra with its symbolic meaning. Archetypal energies manifest very differently through different chakras. The second chakra, for example, is associated with the water element, the will or leviathan, the bladder, and with impulses and urges, including the sexual. The third chakra is associated with the solar plexus, the fire element, and the ram. The fourth with the heart, the element air, and the leaping, light-footed antelope. The first chakra represents the foundational basis of human existence that we share with other animals, psyche, meaning soma. It is associated with the perineum, the earth element and the elephant, the mass, solidity, gravity, on which all else rests. If this space is jeopardized, all other chakras will be compromised and unable to function optimally. It is here that the dynamic polarization of femula, uh, feminine masculine, represented by the Hindu goddess and god Shakti Shiva, still lies dormant. The kundalini, or serpent energy of Shakti, is coiled at the base of the spine until it begins to be unleashed and travels upward through the spine. The heat and energy released in this process manifest the awakening of consciousness. Whereas the base chakra at the bottom of the spine is holding the as yet unawakened, latent potential of kundalini, the seventh or crown chakra represents the awakened psychic possibilities of self-realization, the gods conjoined. The crown chakra signifies the ultimate refinement and differentiation of expanded consciousness for an embodied human being. Because of its highly refined energ uh, energetic activity, the crown chakra is sometimes symbolized as a thousand-petaled lotus. The slow, dark, unconscious, earthy realm of the base chakra has now fully evolved up through all the other chakras into the heavenly flowering of full consciousness in the crown chakra. We literally embody the potential of bringing together heaven and earth within ourselves. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> Let's see if there's another one that I can read. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to read about baldness in the human body section. St. Francis, who in Giotto's painting is preaching to the birds, was born in Assisi into a world of comfort and privilege. After a tumultuous youth, he relinquished his wealth for a life of poverty and compassionate service to the poor and the sick. 
when St. Francis and his followers became clergy in the medieval church, they were tonsured, leaving only a ring of hair on their heads. In the painting, the nimbus of golden light surrounding the head of the saint echoes the tonsure, which itself imitates both Christ's crown of thorns and his crown of divine royalty. Hair can be such a significant aspect of identity that to shave it voluntarily is often experienced as an event of great moment. Since ancient times, hair has been associated with beauty and in men with sexual vigor and seed, given the association of hair with the head and its life-giving fluids. To go bald was perceived as a kind of drought, like dry trees that don't leave. At the same time, in particular cultures and in contemporary fashion, baldness is sometimes seen as revealing and enhancing the beauty of the head. The egghead can denote a bookish person or a superior intellect. Nevertheless, the story of Samson's fall after Delilah sheared his locks attests to the age-old notion of Hare's magical efficacy. Men appealed to wigs, weaves, and medications to reverse unwanted baldness, and for men and women alike, it can be profoundly traumatic to suffer the involuntary loss of hair because of aging, disease, or chemical therapy, as the loss may disturb or permanently alter one's self-image. The notion of interchange is crucial to the symbolic meaning of baldness. To have one's head ritually shaved conveys the idea of consecration, initiation, and spiritual transformation. The hero of the mythic night sea journey loses all of his hair because of the terrific heat in the belly of the beast. Upon joining a religious order or the military, one gives up a piece of one's individuality for the whole, a sacrifice marked by the shaving of one's hair. Like both the death's head and that of the nearly hairless newborn, the initiatory neophyte with shaven head embodies a psychic dying and rebirth. Baldness can also signify punishment, degradation, or a kind of dehumanization, as in the traditional shaving of the heads of criminals or the shaving of the heads of women who fraternize with the enemy in war. On the other hand, through shaving their hair, monks and nuns in Hindu, Buddhist, and Christian religious orders make their vows visible, sever their connection to the imperative of sexual attraction, and expose themselves to the direct influence of the sacred. The symbolic strength of baldness is perhaps precisely because it exposes the surface of the head the brain pan and vessel of understanding and potential change, the container of one's intimate thoughts and imaginings. While baldness is associated symbolically with receptivity to the spiritual and with new life, it also evokes psychic as well as physical nakedness and acute vulnerability. The inevitability of change may require one to submit to a state of baldness, or one may make a statement with baldness, where images of beginning and end, masculine and feminine, nature and spirit, lose their sharp distinctions. Okay. All right. So maybe if, mm, maybe I'll read a couple more. Let's see. Um. Next, I'm going to read about the worm in Primordial Creatures. Who really respects the earthworm, the farm worker far under the grass and the soil? He keeps the earth always changing. He works entirely full of soil, speechless with soil, and blind. He is the underneath farmer, the underground one where the fields are getting on their harvest clothes. Who really respects him, this deep and calm earth worker, 
the deathless gray tiny farmer in this planet's soil, Harry Martinson, the earthworm. The diminutive figure in her burial shroud represents matron clay or mother earth who one with the worm she nourishes is earthworm the humblest form of matter following the alchemical principle of as above so below however blake's imagination sees in the earthworm as much a dwelling place for the divine as the loftiest aspect of the heavens Blake's worm embodies the symbolic complex that has arisen around this small, simple animal. Worms are legless, naked, tube-like, segmented creatures belonging to many different phyla. Their primitive physiology, undulating movements, and often slimy exteriors all contribute to their capacity to disturb us. Free feeding or parasitic, worms have commonly been confused with insect larvae like maggots. The worm's quiet work of breaking down matter has made it a metaphor for insidious destructiveness. The worm has symbolically been associated with death and decay, the gnawing of corpses and the fear of burial. This sense of horror is captured in the description of hell from the ancient Scandinavian Edda. Dripping poison dropped from the roof, the chamber walls, are bodies of worms. Yet the particular characteristics of the earthworm that repel many are also the things that make it so valuable to nature. The earthworm's underground tunneling and excretions <clears throat> aerate um, and condition the soil to optimally support the growth of seed and shoot. Alchemy associated the worm with the stage of putrefaction, evoking the breaking down of dysfunctional attitudes that were overripe in order to prepare the individual's psychic ground for organic renewal. In a number of creation myths, New life arises from the worms that feed on the corpse of a primordial being. Similarly, in the myth of the phoenix, what first emerges from the ashes is a tiny worm, suggesting the despised thing that is paradoxically the source of the personality's luminous potential. Because of its humbleness, literally its closeness to the earth and its physical vulnerability, humans project on the earth, uh, earthworm lowliness and even groveling spineless, uh, groveling spineless behavior. The Hebrew psalmist feeling forsaken by God cries out, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Yet for Christianity, the same verse is a reference to the chosen one, the Messiah. Like the fly and the grain of sand, the earthworm is an image of the punctum, the tiniest point um, where eternity resides, insignificant and godlike. Earthworm is the mutability of earth and all that is of earth. Beauty, life itself, psyche are subject to change, decay and disintegration. But just as the earthworm can regenerate its lost segments into new, so does the worm's earth become the ground of rebirth. Hmm. And then at the bottom of this picture, it says, I have said to the worm, Thou art my mother and my sister. Okay. I think I'm going to stop there for now. Um, as I said before, if you want for me to read more of this book in future videos, um, leave a like 
on this one and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. I hope that you enjoyed this and thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and goodbye for now.